Hello guys, this is Cindy Kim from Wayland to share and welcome back. Be a philosopher, but amidst all your philosophy, be still a man. Do you know this quote? The person who wrote this is the philosopher that we'll be looking at today, David Hume. Hume was born in 1711 in Edinburgh, England. Then he enrolled as a student at the University of Edinburgh in 1722. After four years, in 1726, Hume began his legal, legal education, dreaming of becoming a lawyer. Then, in 1729, it changed. He no longer wanted to become a lawyer, and a new scene of thought opened. Then he traveled to London and worked as a merchant's clerk in Bristol. He then moved to France to work on his writings. He continued to publish his writings after moving back to London, and then he died back in Edinburgh in 1776. As we did with other philosophers, we will first take a look at how David Hume defined human nature. Now, when we look at human nature as defined by other philosophers, they usually give us the idea of the good and bad behaviors of humans in a state without society. But Hume, with his state of nature, dives in much deeper. He gives us the concept of perceptions, which lays at the very root of human experience. This concept of perception is divided into two, impressions and ideas. Impressions are what interpret your senses, emotion, and passions when first appeared, Ideas are a developed form of impressions where these impressions are expressed as vague images through ideas, through reasoning and thinking. Although a relationship between ideas and impressions exists, ideas derived from impression, the process may not always be so straightforward, as sometimes we can imagine things that are quite unrealistic. Hume also gives us the concept of causation. Causation cannot be directly experienced, nor can our senses cite the necessity the necessary connection of causation. It is an idea that is formed through imagination and experience. As I said, causation cannot be directly experienced as we cannot spot an object causing another one. But what we do instead is that we develop a sense of constant conjunction for multiple objects. And this helps us predict that a certain action will still follow another action in the future. And through this process of reasoning, we encounter the concept of necessary connection between the cause and effect. And Hume explains that the lives and actions depend on belief in causation, and it is our nature to believe in one. Now let's look at Hume's moral philosophy. His moral philosophy is, in uni is as unique as his human nature. Most of the moral philosophies from others give us the standards on deciding whether an action is good or bad. But unlike these ideas, in his moral philosophy, Hume seeks to find out how we choose to make moral judgments. He focused on the motivation. Hume crosses out and sense Hume crosses out senses and reason as the potential motives of moral judgments when analyzing the concept of causation. He stated that sense is not a factor that helps us when looking for moral virtues. He stated that morality is in oneself, not in the object as it is the dissatisfaction that you feel inside yourself that makes you do more judgments, not the object itself. And why do we eliminate reason? This is because reason does not produce free will, but only seeks to decide whether one is right or wrong, true or false. But although reason does not produce passions and motivations, it does help us with achieving the goal set up by our motivation. It is the concept of moral sentiment that distinguishes morality from the concept of reason, and also defines the idea of morality itself. The definition of morality set up by Hume is an act that is virtuous because it causes a specific and pleasurable sentiment of encouragement. And the definition of a vicious action, in contrast, is an action that ev evokes painful dissatisfaction. dissatisfaction. And the moral judgments derived from the sentiments that are brought up in response to actions and individuals. Now we can take a look at the political ideas of Hume in his 1748 essay of the original contract. Here he targets the social contract theory that the English Whigs and the English Tories supported. The argument of English Whigs was that the authority of the government lies on the content created by those who are governed. This is the idea that a typical social contract theory holds, that in exchange for protection and justice, the people consented to give authority to the rulers. And when people can give authority to the ruler, they could also take it back. So if the ruler fails to do what they are expected to do, then they would take the authority away, possibly through rebellion. So the theory of English Whigs just justifies rebellions. Hume commented that this theory was in contrast to the common sentiments of men, 
into the practices and ideas of states and people of all regions and ages. He thought that the existing governments were not founded by consent, but humans just seem to believe it that way. Hume also talks about theory supported by the English Tories. This theory believed that the authority of the sovereign appears due to its divine origin, not from consent. Since this theory talks about how the sovereignty has its divine authority, the subjects must obey and be loyal to the sovereign, not just by rebellions. Different from these theories, Hume believed that the origin of a government lay in the idea of the government being found, not something like consent of divine authority. For him, it was the duty for alliance created to solve human problems that lie underneath the concept of government. Today, we took a look at the human nature, the morality and political theory of Hume. And personally, especially with his idea on human nature, I thought it was very similar to the ideas expressed by Kant involving empirical concepts. I hope this video was helpful for you. And this is it for today. See you in another video. Bye.